Well, quite a bit has changed on Broadway within the past 50 or so years. Howard Johnson's is gone, the arcades are gone, and quite a few buildings and even a few theaters are gone. But we still have one thing, and that is my guest, Mr. John Cullum. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, he's, maybe he's outlived his usefulness, but I hope not. Well, you're in August Osage County now, and I think anyone who sees you in that would disagree. When you started off as an actor on Broadway, the shows were ridiculously expensive to produce. They were concentrating on commercial rather than artistic vehicles, and ticket prices were too high. Has anything changed? No, now that you point that out, Charles, <laughs> it's, it's exactly the same. And, and continually, uh, that, that's, that same problem keeps recurring. That's true. That's, that's the, uh, the, the cycle. It keeps going that way. And was the theater dying back then, too? Oh, yes. The theater was about to die um, in, in the 50s and, uh, well, in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s and the 80s and the 90s. <laughs> but we've, it, we've managed to survive somehow. As the song goes, we're still here. Uh, yes, that's right. I know you're primarily known for southern parts, but you've actually understudied Richard Burton on, I think, more than one occasion. Uh, I, I didn't underst I understudied Richard in Camelot, and people think that I understudied him in Hamlet, but I didn't. I played Laertes in Hamlet, and uh, I, I guess I was his understudy. Yes, I did. I understudied him in, um, in Private Lives. Uh, with, li with Elizabeth Taylor. That's right. Mm, and uh, I, I was playing Victor Preen, which is the worst role ever r written <laughs> that Noel Crowd wrote specifically for Olivier, for Lawrence Olivier, and insisted that he play it. And, and I know that Olivier must have suffered under that. But, but it was, uh, it w and I suffered during that play, and there was a lot of drinking going on there. There was a lot of drinking going on all the time around Richard, uh, particularly in Camelot. Um, but, uh, but people don't, people who, at least I, I was on stage with Richard as m probably more than anybody. And um, only on one occasion did I ever see him drink t more than he should have in terms of doing a, a good performance. And he was, he was sick at the time. He'd been taking medication. Did you ever uh, have to go on for him in Camelot? Yes, I went on for him four times. That was the first time he'd ever had an understudy go on for him. Richard was extremely powerful and strong, and he... He couldn't stand the idea of anybody going on for him, but he, um, he and I s remained friends after that. But, uh, and you went on opposite Julie Andrews. That must have been yeah. something. That was lovely, wonderful, wonderful. She's a tremendous performer, and uh, she had a lot to put up with in that company, but, uh, and, and, and a lot to put up with, in, from what I hear, in My Fair Lady. But she, is a, she sailed through it and uh, came out of it a, a great star. Now, when you first did Shenandoah, I think that was in the early 70s, that was right on... Mm -hmm. That's for 74. That was right on the heels of the Vietnam War, a very unpopular war. We're in the midst of another unpopular war. Has anyone approached you, or have you heard about more, an unusual number of revivals of the show, say, even in colleges or around the country? Well, I'm, I'm a little old and long in the tooth, although I could play it. I was too young when I played it the first time. I actually uh, was a, a, a 44, and I had seven kids and a grandchildren, grandchildren so it, uh, I, could pl I could still play it, but not, a, not in the same way that I did then. And I hadn't thought about it. I have thought about it uh, many times over the years. I did a revival. Uh, after about 10 years. You were a little older then. Did you take a different approach to the role? I mean, just not so much physically, but based on the experiences that you had, you had since then, since the original production. It was a Canadian company, and it was a very good company. And uh, uh, they brought it down here, and I took over and, and played it. And it, uh, I, I did it 
very much like I'd done it the first time, but it was very interesting because 10 years had elapsed. We were in the, in the middle of uh, the Vietnamese situation, and uh, there was a lot of uh, people who, there were a lot of people, no matter, if you, if you were f uh, a hawk, you thought that this show was t talking about, um, um, you know, defending and fighting for your rights. And if you were a dove, they, they thought that you were a person who was against the war. So it was, it was a mixed bag. But 10 years later, and we got mixed reviews. And 10 years later, when we came back, the play was exactly the same. And we got m marvelous reviews. The, the, same, the same critics came back and saw it and said, I don't know, they, they didn't know what had happened, but they thought it had changed. It hadn't changed. Times had changed. It would be an interesting play to do now. Now, I know you've done your share of television and movies, 1776 notably, but what was it about Northern Exposure that lured you out to Hollywood? Well, um, there, uh, there was a, I, 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 I really don't know. Northern Exposure was a kind of a snuck up on me in a way. Um, I didn't expect to, to, to get it. I did a, I did a, a, a uh, they taped a, uh, an audition for me in New York, and I forgot about it. And then the next thing I knew, I was in California, and they asked me to come and meet with somebody. And, and I, I saw the other people that I was up against, and some of them were huge, big guys, and, and had, they were, one I remembered was an old movie star. Uh, 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 a uh, cowboy movie star, and I thought, well, they're going in a different. And another one was a guy that that I knew very well. He played my brother in the trip back down, and he was more. He was. They were burly and 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 big and tough looking, and that's what I figured. That's the way they were going, and uh, so I kind of horsed around a little bit in the audition and played for the humor. And then, and then I got a call that afternoon, and the next thing I knew, we were doing five episodes during the summer. And it was a wonderful, wonderful bunch of people, and a kooky, wonderful show, and a great place to do it in Seattle. And uh, it just all clicked together. And it was four years of, of uh, delightful work, four and a half years. It was five seasons. And uh, and then it was over and gone. Uh, but it was a wonderful experience. And certainly one of the most original shows that they've ever done on television. Now, after that, you were telling me you, you were itching to get back to Broadway. Did you, now, now that you were internationally known, I mean, certainly you hadn't been known in theater circles. Now you were a national quote-unquote celebrity. Did you notice any change in, in the attitude either by the Broadway people or by your, your audience? Oh, yeah. It's, uh, it's, uh, uh, it, there's a big change. There are three different John Cullums. Now, when I went out there to do uh, Northern Exposure, they had no idea who I was. And uh, I remember the third, episode, the first, third or fourth episode, there was, uh, there, was a, there was an occasion when they were s supposed to play music from Broadway hits, the title songs. And one of them was on a clear day, and I, I, I told one of the fellow actors, that if they play the, the title song from that show, it's me singing that song. And they, didn't, they had no idea that I was even in, the, in, in musicals at all. So when I came back uh, and got into um, well, Showboat was what I, I think I told you about Showboat. I expected to be in a big musical where I'd sing a lot and I got into showboat and Captain Annie doesn't sing a lick but uh, but it was fun anyway it was and it was a big musical but it, it's no question that when you have that uh, that exposability that, that you get from TV that you you're um, you're much more desirable as a uh, as a Broadway actor <coughs> and uh, but a lot of people it's strange. It didn't people think of me as as Hollington Coor, 
when they come to see me, they're surprised, and but they 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 recognize me as Holling Van Coor, um, and that's that surprises me a little bit. But um, everything else that you've done over 40, 50 years. Yeah, well, they don't know about that. Uh, all of that stuff. It's um, fame is fleeting, and I can tell you it is. It just doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't last forever. And that's okay, because there's, time goes on. Now, in all the years you've been doing shows, obviously when you're in a show, there's one major disadvantage. You can't go and see them. Is there any show that you've missed along the way that you would have liked to have seen? Any, any Broadway show? Uh, are you kidding? In, I mean, I, mean I, I don't see... The, the, yes, I've spent most of my time in, on on the stage working uh, and um, the, these last few years have been kind of a, a, uh, a totally different uh, experience for me. I've graduated to off-Broadway and off-off-Broadway and, and I've worked in, uh, in the nonprofit or, uh, theaters, the big ones and the little ones, and uh, they're always limited runs. Now, my career started with Camelot, which lasted, oh, I was in that for a year and a half, and then On a Clear Day was about a year, and then Shenandoah was two and a half years, and uh, uh, On the 20th Century was a year and, and a few months. So those eat up a lot of time, and you're right, I didn't see hardly, I didn't see anything while I was doing those shows, except the, uh, occasionally I, I would be able to see the, uh, um, uh, the benefit shows that they did. And uh, unfortunately, uh, I haven't seen nearly as much as I'd like to. On the 20th century, that, for what it's worth, that was the first show I ever saw you in. I went standing room, and what, I, what was interesting that day was they had a stand, and I said, oh, I hope it's not G John Cullum or Imogene Coca, and it turned out to be Judy Kay, who had a wonderful career since then. Oh, you mean you saw Judy for the first time? Mm -hmm. When I saw her, when I saw the show. She wasn't out. She wasn't out. Judy never was out, was she? she w well, at the time, she was standing in for Madeline Kahn. She was Madeline Kahn's understudy, and Madeline Kahn apparently was having some problems that year. Right, right. Um, she, she was ready. She's the, she's the Broadway um, uh, success story, you know, the... Uh, she, she was ready when, when the occasion arose, and she took over. Um, and Madeline was marvelous, and, and Judy was extraordinary. So I guess everybody won in that situation. The, the side effect is, after 30 years and seeing her in numerous plays, I still think of her as a blonde, even though I know, even in, even in the playbill of her on the 20th century, there she is, she's a brunette. Right. And every time I see her, she's a brunette, really? What happened to the blonde hair? R right, 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 right. Okay, um, when you did You're in Town, you warned everybody, don't be the bunny. But apparently being a dog is all right, because you did that in How the Cringe spelled, uh, Stole Christmas, excuse me. You looked like you were having a lot of fun with that. I did, old dog, old dog Max, uh, although I must admit that I had great reservations about doing that. I remember when my, my agent called me and said that they were doing The Grinch, and uh, would, you, would I be willing to do the Old Dog Max? It's a good role, he said, and, and it's a, uh, you know, he's like a narrator, and, uh, and it's, just, it's a wonderful big production. And I said, oh, sure, yeah, okay. Well, then I, I went to bed, and, and it was Friday night, and, I, and I, I woke up in the middle of the night, and I just in a cold sweat, and I got up, and I, called, I woke my agent up before dawn and said, Jeff, I can't do this. I mean, I mean... I, I mean, what if I die on stage? I said, I, my people will think of me as the old actor who died in a dog outfit on stage. I said, I, I can't do it. And I turned it down, but then he talked me back into it. But you were in a more tr uh, traditional setting a little later that season. You were with Audrey McDonald. That's true. You do, you do your homework on that. I'd forgotten that. Yeah, of course, on uh, 110 in the Shade. That's interesting. I played the... Played her daddy in that, and uh, what you probably don't know is that uh, I was also up for the 
for the Starbuck in the original production. Yeah. Mm. You're right. I didn't. I didn't. All right. Well, John Cullen, thank you very much. My Continued right. uh, success. Thank you very much, Charles. It's a delight to be here. Thank you.